we make our shots. We all do. That's what we do. That's what we do. And we keep doing it. Good afternoon, Giles. Thank you for joining me. And thank you for joining us on the spirit behind the lens, the conversations. Uh, Giles, you're a photographer. And we are obviously talking about photography. And this is what we talk about. But there's a hyphenation here, like photographer slash hip hop or photographer slash and in your slash it's well let's take it back to you being 15 years old let's say and let's say you're in school and you've got your notebooks and you're drawing on it I don't know if you're drawing tanks or helicopters or whatever action man figures but within a year you're in the field you are out there as a young marine age 17 signed up to the service and for some reason you take a camera with you what was going on in young Giles's mind? Uh, I don't know, actually. It's a long time ago now. It's, um, yeah, I mean, it's so long ago that I've got nephews of that age and everyone looks at me with a sort of blank face going, oh, what do you mean you join the Marines when you're 16? Um, I don't know. I mean, it felt like the thing to do at the time for me, even looking back on it as a 50-year-old now. Um, I think, you know, my motivations at the time probably fit into a lot of you know I was a certain type of character kid at that age and you know at school you know I wasn't academic I was at state school at the time that didn't play competitive sports or other schools so there wasn't any way of me going to get sort of energies and sort of physicality out um, but being that I grew up I'm from Watford originally so oh. you know being that sort of bridge and tunnel esque type shire you know one, one way was the you know the big bad silly and the other way was sort of green field so i very much grew up in that environment um uh, but from the quite early from like six seven i was in the cubs and i was in the scouts and about 11 i joined actually I joined the sea cadets so i had this sort of i don't know jacqueline hyde type sort of character i'd go to school and just cause chaos and i was in you know i was in with gangs and all sorts of madness and then twice a week i'd go to cadets and i was like top cadet so suddenly having this sort of you know that sort of those sort of really hard boundaries at that age anyway so i you know i really responded to so if there were no boundaries i'd cause chaos or if there was real regimentation i just love it um and then yeah i did my i was sort of youngest in my year so i left school technically at 15 i basically flunked pretty much all my gcse's uh, but I'd always, at sort of, as you started this with, at sort of 15, I'd already decided that actually, you know, I wanted to join the military in some sort of capacity. Um, and then, you know, I was a bit like, okay, what well, if you're going to give it a go, then, you know, what's the sort of hardest, longest sort of training you can give it a crack on? So that's what I did, you know, with no expectations of actually surviving it or getting in. And yeah, before I know it, it was, you know, you'll get this, we're a similar sort of age, you know, it's like a sort of full metal jacket movie, you know, you join up in the first two weeks, you're in that, <laughs> that really long, yeah. like linear type, uh, you know, sort of barrack. And there's the guy with a paste it, you know, smacking people. And it was suddenly you're like, wow, I'm in the movie. Um, but I think probably my, probably my youth actually helped me in a way because I didn't have any sort of, you know, uh, any other life experience. And I joined up, there were like 54 of us. And there were about 10 of us who were under 18 or classed as juniors. And the rest all the way up to like, you know, guys in their late 20s. So it was a real, um, but I think because of that, I just, you know, I just loved it. You know, for all that stuff that I was sort of wired into or interested in at the time. It was like, well, I'm getting paid to, you know, jump out, don't know, jump out of helicopters and shoot guns and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah. That was my uh, that was my intro into into joining anyway. <clears throat> Absolutely. Um, I mean, I went to a nautical school. I too was in sea cadets. It was definitely given that we're both fifty. I think we both experienced the same sort of world where you had youth clubs which were wild and had sound systems in it, or you went to sea cadets or you know army cadets. Uh, sea cadets. I didn't know you were a sea cadet, were you? Yeah, no, no, I'm definitely there. Yeah. But I have to be yeah. honest with you. I was there for the uniform. It had a better uniform. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> way better than the green. Yeah, and, yeah, totally, totally. And going to a nautical school, I kind of saw myself in the sort of, you know, it was a part of a gang and I liked being part of a gang. But it was also kind of the earliest photographs I have is taking pictures of the gang, of the gang that you're with at that time. Because as far as you're concerned, these are the greatest people you've ever met. Yeah. And um, 
I'm feeling that when I see these photographs that you've taken, uh, particularly at that age where it is. I mean, the photography is pure in the sense that it's a it's yeah. it's great light, great camera, no fucking about with the you know it's it's in focus, everything's there, but it's also in the sense like wake the shot of the helicopter was was very much like waking up in the morning and seeing that thing at dawn and the romance of war photography. But I'm not sure how conscious you are of photography at that age versus yeah. you know. Totally, totally. I, I, yeah, and this is a sort of I class this as a sort of sort of uh, semi-conscious photo diary because you know yeah. yeah I wasn't you know I definitely wasn't conscious of you know photographic history, photographic you know visual language within conflict, all of these things. I, you know I really was just a just a kid who had a I had a little pocket thirty-five mil film camera that my parents bought me actually just before I deployed. And I had like five rolls of film. I was there for five months and, you know, I just random moments. And of course, the interesting thing about, you know, having then gone back and being a, an observer within conflict zones, the thing on the other side of the, you know, other side of it, as it were, is that a lot of the time you're not in the position, you're too busy doing your job to actually take pictures. So that auto starts to sort of construct a narrative around the sort of moments when, you know, I felt I'd get a camera out and take a picture. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I'd had a sort of actually my dad, my grandfather's, you know, there were always cameras floating around in the family. You know, it was always actually my grandmother, you know, my grandmother documented all the family events for years and built these big scrapbooks. And so photography was always, always present, you know, in a, in a sort of lived type, you know, family environment. <clears throat> Did so you I imagine think that just extended it onto me then? Taking yeah. It in. So, so then, so the first time you, that gets me thinking about many things is because it's like all right i'm taking the picture are you sending the picture back home to mum so that they can see what's going on in the world you're in are you also looking to tell a story down the line how were stories of the family shared like will the scrapbook come out and nan will start explaining everything and tell a joke behind the picture of this story was that a part of your understanding of photography in that working class way yeah, I mean, it was, yeah. I mean, actually, I was, you know, I'm more actually, I have a middle-class background. Okay. Um, my uh, my dad, my dad was a solicitor. Well, he, he didn't go to uni, so he worked up from being a sort of legal clerk. So, you know, when I was younger, we didn't have a lot of money, but as he started to work up, we became much more sort of middle-class within that sort of um, type sort of reality. So um, within, within sort of family experiences and sharing things yeah it was my, you know it was the photo album you'd go on holiday you'd take your pictures you'd have your photo album you'd share it with family you know close friends whatever um so that was that sort of culture family culture i'd grown up in anyway um, okay. but in that in that weird sort of just just on the middle class thing did you ever feel the pressure to be be successful at school were you under it or did you feel free enough to be yourself Oh no, I, I felt under it. I think that was that was that was a background thing of me not being academic, and sort of and sort of basically failing in that capacity, and then getting in with yeah, gangs and sort of all of that sort of nonsense. I think yeah, there was totally that pressure coming in, and I think my parents were a bit like, oh, what's happening to our son? But then at like fifteen, sixteen, I went, I know there's something I want to do, and I don't think they definitely didn't have that in mind for me. Uh, and actually, they both had to sign me in because under 18, you have to have both of your parents' guardian signatures to, to join the British military, who still recruit now at 16. Although the, the, in 2003, the UN Convention on Children's Rights uh, forced the British government to stop sending people under 18 into conflict zones. So I was sort of last of the 20th century sort of boy soldiers in that capacity. Um, but yeah, totally. I mean, it's really intriguing when I see your work because it does feel like the last of the 20th century sort of imageries of warfare and that you were there right at the beginning of that to tell that story. And then at the same time, your contemporary work is really following this this journey along. So tell me something about being discharged at 20 and looking back on your, on your life in the army through photography. Yeah, I mean... Um... Yeah, I'm what they call in the Marines, you know, not the army. That's in the Marines, that's all right. I know there's, I know we get sent. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a tribal, I'm not a yeah. tribal cat. So on that level, Thank but you. yeah, the, poly, the, uh, the military does revolve around, <laughs> yeah, around exactly. us and tribalism big time. But you know, yeah, oh my god, um, 
yeah. Uh, I don't know. I so yeah. I got basically I got injured out there, and yeah. I got injured in a what would be classed as sort of non kinetic way. I didn't get shot. I didn't get blown up. But where we're operating, Sanam had used sort of chemical agents against the Kurds, who were basically we we're in there, um, basically protecting. So I slightly widen the caveat at the end of the first Gulf War. Basically, there was a the Shia Marsh Arabs in the south rose up, and the Kurds rose up in the north of Iraq after you know decades and decades of uh, you know being suppressed uh, by Saddam. They saw this as an opportunity, saw it as a weakness, basically. Um, and we went into northern Iraq to basically provide security for the Kurds to stop the Iraqi army moving north to basically commit more atrocities against them. Uh, and then in the process of that, providing aid to them and then basically sort of bringing them back and back down at their towns and vi villages. And then we hung around for a little bit policing because human nature kicks in. Suddenly the big bad guy's not around. So, you know, older politics, you know, older issues come into play. So different factions start finding it out. So we did a bit of policing and then we, and then we left. Um, so within the context of that, we were operating in these areas where, you know, Saddam had been using, all sorts of different types of weapon systems, chemical weapons, weapon systems and stuff. And the residue of that breaks down and gets into the environment. And basically, I, I absorbed an um, insane amount of phosphates, which at the time what didn't affect me, but within a, within a month of coming back, I basically lost like four stone in body weight. And it basically rotted, it rotted my bowel away. <clears throat> wow. So I got, yeah, I got medically discharged at 20 as a war pensioner um and then these images actually got me into uh, so by that point a mature student i didn't know what else i was going to do actually my mum's oh when are you going to uni study photography i'm like oh. um <laughs> anyway fortunately for me the uh derby university uh at the time had a really really wide really wide course of people who they took on and I applied with these set of images that some of them you'll see now. And yeah, they accepted me as mature students. So, you know, these images for me became my sort of, uh, uh, you, you know, they, they gave me a sense of purpose outside of that. You know, they just sort of therapy, onward movement in life, anything. It gave me a really uh, sort of constructive thing to be able to sort of follow in life off the back of having made them and the circumstances that then, you know, came into being after that. So. Yeah. Like, uh, I really appreciate that, but I also appreciate that given, you know, what we're going to see later in terms of your, the work that you do today, did you feel freedom to use photography in a non, did you, did you play around? Did you do a fashion shoot? Did you do a band photography? Did you do oh, what, post, yeah, yeah. post uni? Yeah, exactly. Did you get into Oh yeah. Yeah. Photography? Well, I mean, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a mutual friend of ours. Actually the first day at Derby, I met Jermaine Francis. So, okay. uh, so yeah, that was it 30 years ago this year. Um, and then we both, did our degree, came to London, you know, he went off on his channel, I went off on mine. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I assisted in sort of, you know, high-end luxury, fashion, high advertising world for like nearly seven years, um, which was, uh, yeah, which was amazing. It was amazing yeah. experience within that. It was amazing experience to sort of the mechanics, equally the visual language of that world, particularly, you know, where I've always, you know, I haven't really worked in that world, but, you know, the visual, you know, just the, yeah, the visual language within fashion and things like that. I always, found very, always found very interesting. But you never, you, you came back to the military language, the military language within photography, didn't you? You, you stuck with that. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I got to a point, actually, I got to a point where I finished, I was coming to the end of assisting, and I was like, right, I've got to go and do my thing. And actually, my health caught up with me. So when I'd been to, when I'd been at uni, I'd had to have all my, my whole bowel removed, I had to have full bowel reconstruction. Um, and then basically, that new bowel lasted me until I finished assisting. And basically, I had to go and have my whole bowel, my re reconstructed bowel removed again. And it took me out. I was out for like 18 months. And yeah, in a bit of sort of heavy reflecting, I was like, 
you know what? I'm just gonna be an idealist. I just wanna, I just wanna follow what interests me and not follow the money. <laughs> Yeah. Which, you know, <laughs> you make wow. your bed, you got to lie in it. But anyway, so I was like, right, no, I'm going to just have a, uh, you know, have a practice in sort of documentary, practice in storytelling and be led by that uh, yeah. for good, for bad, for indifference. Um, so really that's what, that was the sort of juncture away from sort of what would have been following a career in, you know, advertising or fashion or, you know, at the end of the day, I just, I didn't love it enough. I think, no. you know, I always say this to, to students or people and I'm like, you know, you got to, to survive in, you know, photography in any part of it is that, you know, you basically, you got to be an addict, you know, you, you're not going to get anywhere unless it's literally your like number one driving force and to do anything and anybody, whether they're big in ad world, whatever world at the end of the day, that's their driving, driving position in life is I've got to make more of these sort of images. Right. Yeah. Um, yes. So yeah, that was my decision to, yeah, take a sort of, or stick to a sort of documentary path. I mean, in terms of sticking to the documentary path, you've shot this image, what, 17, and it's of the city of Mosul, I, I believe? No, this one here is actually a hilltop town in uh, in northern Iraq. Okay. Uh, which, I mean, I don't actually have it credit. It's, yeah, it's a, it's a hilltop Kurdish village on the okay. sort of Iran-Iraq border area. Okay. So it just it felt like you just to me it looked like an a, a, a hill to, an image of uh, Mosul from from a distance, which I'm assuming is because it might be on raised ground. But because uh, I wanted to lead up to your the new body of work, particularly um, as it's sort of you know it, it it talks about vertical warfare, it talks about drone warfare particularly, and it revisits northern Iraq, but several a, de a few decades later and how does that feel for you to, to come back to the space again yeah i mean it was i mean i but so by the time i'd finished assisting then been through all these other surgeries and decided that no i was going to just you know commit myself to a sort of documentary type practice uh i started getting work for like new york times magazine and time and nat geo and people so i you know i'd made inroads out there and I'd, I'd, I'd had quite a good run working at the New York Times Mag. And in 2017, uh, Kathy Ryan, I think, leaves today, the legendary uh, photo director there, asked me whether I'd go into Mosul while the battle was on. And, you know, I'd, I'd stayed away from conflict. You know, lots of people said, oh, you should, you know, she's going to be a conflict photographer. Oh, no. <laughs> You know, I've got, I've got, you know, with my history, I just wasn't interested. And I was definitely wasn't interested in just, you know, going creating more similar narrative type imagery on top of that. I was like, if I'm going to go for my, you know, in any context for myself, for a story, for, you know, that needs to be told, then it's got to have something, you know, special to it. Um, and then they, uh, yeah, so this, this story was about wrongly targeted coalition strike sites. Uh, and I worked with this journalist called Asmat Khan, and this woman had spent like a year in northern Iraq under ISIS-controlled northern Iraq, basically going around plotting what had been wrongly targeted sites. And this article, she did sold this article to the New York Times, and the New York Times, about to publish it, wanted some considered work on it. And at the time, I'd been doing a lot of aerial perspective stuff, which actually back to that hilltop town you'd shown, that's sort of one of my earliest aerials. But I'd been doing a lot of high vista type aerial type shots. So they were like, right, you know, uh, we, need, we need to shoot these strike sites. But these strike sites, you know, sadly, rubble and destruction on ground level, sadly, after a while, what one pile of rocks could have been a house, could have been a school, could have been a whatever. But of course, you elevate a bit, you just show a little bit more context to it. So initially, I was going to take a drone in, but I couldn't because uh, the Iraqis were basically with, were trying to hold back drones getting into ISIS. And ISIS were the were basically they were the first group of people who weaponized consumer drones so everything happened in ukraine gaza all this stuff now started by isis basically strapping bombs onto these you know phantom phantom dji drones and targeting civilians iraqi army so because of that i couldn't take one in i ended up taking in a like a 40 foot guttering inspection carbon fiber pole which i then stuck a camera on top 
So I'd get into the middle of like Mosul and I'd <laughs> I'd get this massive pole, <laughs> stick this pole up. And for some of the jobs, we had like a New York Times security guy with me, uh, who equally was ex-British military guy. And he'd just be like, I've seen a lot of stuff in my time. But I've never seen anyone turn into, you know, turn up into, you know, active firefight and you're sticking up huge poles. Anyway, for the context of the New York Times story, it worked. And on the last couple of days out there, as Matt, the journalist I was working with, managed to find an off-duty uh, Iraqi army officer who had a drone and we gave him like 500 bucks. He managed to get squares away some permissions and we managed to shoot some of these strike sites from a sort of aerial drone type perspective. But um, the uh, you know, DJI, the Chinese manufacturer, put us like a geolocation block on the software. So unless you knew how to hack it or you had unhacked software, you couldn't fly it off the normal uh, sort of apps. Uh, but I'd been playing around with this technology called photogrammetry. I don't even know that's. Mm -hmm. So photogrammetry is, is basically it's the three-dimensional recording of something, an item or, or an environment, through photographs. So you pay to take hundreds of photographs which slightly overlap, and you put them into a bit of software, and it will remake you that environment i heard a rumor that dgi had bought out hasselblad as a weird they have, yeah. cyclical they have haven't they i just really oh, wanted to fact check that just mm. just just by nature of how much power they grew off the back of this tech and yeah sorry just wanted to just no 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 it's it's well that was a couple of years ago, but I think actually they sort of saved Hasselblad. Hasselblad yeah. was in trouble, and yeah. they took, you know, DJI, for those who maybe aren't aware, is the largest consumer drone manufacturer in the world who actually have 90% of the consumer drone market. You know, they're like the apple of drones. Um, and actually now, because of what's, you know, particularly in war in Ukraine, they are now the largest supplier of drones into war zones legitimately or not depending what side of that you want to you know there are certain people who say that they're providing the russians with you know their dji drones minus some of the firmware which makes them slightly harder to target but anyway, a lot of that's hearsay but whether or not they actively are doing it or not they're now you know there's tens of thousands of these drones used every day in ukraine um yeah. But, but that winds back to Mosul, where this was the first time where these drones were used in a you know in a combative way. Um, and I mean, that's just you know, I mean, again, it's like human nature. These you know, as soon as something comes out there, somebody's going to do something great with it, and mm -hmm. someone's going to go, "Hey, if we do this like this, then." So yeah. that's where this this conversation of the politics of verticality, which is this, yeah. uh, you know, this uh, you know, basically this position that anyone who owns the high ground or a place uh, you know, above can dominate in a, in a certain way. Um, and of course that's just now opened up. So, that, you know, it has been big state militaries or corporations where it's satellites or whatever. And of course now, you know, organizations or individuals can now get drones and use them in nefarious, whatever ways they want. So this is now widening out these conflicts and the intensification so that's yeah. what this sort of work was, was 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 it was trying to hold this tech and this use to this historical point yeah. i was just going to say also context as well it's like ultimately we can you know the first time i saw a drone was probably in piccadilly circus when journalists were using drones to fly over people's walls so they can shoot their garden parties um yeah, yeah. <laughs> so photographers journalists again this early 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 use but here's the context of it once the once the image is now used it's now processed these mm. squares these blue dots these they're, they're ways of signifying to a human and, a, and an ai device that is potentially a target or in the case oh, it shouldn't have been a target but it became targeted yep. i find that it's once digitized digitized human existence digitized warfare we, we are entering a new very much like when when we lost when film di disappeared and replaced with digital cameras, something else happened. We and we're you're really pulling that front and center in this new project. Um, and it's called Phantom Pro. You asked the DGI, well, not named it after, but you've added the fact that it's the Phantom device, and the Pro is this idea that it's 
professional. But what is what happens to these images? This is the key now, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, yeah, the Pro, I mean, actually the Phantom Pro 4 was the last iteration. So the Phantom was the first, or not quite the first, but it was the first DJI mass produced. And they went for a few iterations and the final one was the Phantom Pro. Um, and I don't know the sort of name, you know, because for me, this works about this tension between dual use technologies, how we now have technologies which have initially been designed for sort of peace and are now being used as weapons. And the sort of the process that I've made these images with, which is photogrammetry, which is this 3D mapping of, of a landscape with photographs. Uh, at the same time as ISIS, of course, we're using this new technology to drop bombs and, you know, target people. The construction industries were using it to remotely scan building sites to monitor the development of building sites because they could survey them more accurately than and more regularly and cheaper than sending people in. So for me, it was this interesting tension of here's this technology, here's a here's a, a photogrammetry technology that's not only used in the sort of construction world, but has a history aligned to the military in World War One. It was the first time it was used with from aerial reconnaissance planes to, to make targeting more accurate. Mm. So we've got these two technologies that, you know, drones, which again, come from the, you know, industrial military complex, photogrammetry, which has its histories within uh, the military and warfare. And then now this sort of crossover and through the process of sort of rendering out these landscapes, all of the all of these sort of artifacts you see, all those little crosses or mm. you know the targets, or actually actually they're tie points. They're the points that pull in all of the they're the points that basically align most of the photographs in the image that sort of pull these things together. Um, but for me, that 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 tension between the two, you know, is that a target because it's been destroyed, or is that a you know a, a photogrammetry reconstruction point of something being rebuilt? Um, so I found I found that that tension in the artifacts quite interesting. We're trying to sort of convey this sort of, you know, this this point in time where this technology had its sort of inception impact. And yeah, I mean, Ukraine, all these places now, you know, it's the modern warfare now is just being dominated by these, you know, tiny little drones. I, f I find it interesting that it almost feels like it, you know, it was talk of it being the end of the tank because drones can pretty much mm. nerf a tank. And I feel like it's a hundred years of tanks and already it, it's already come into probably its end game. There was no point in having a tank. Uh, and I mean, again, I, I can see drones for, for, for really useful purposes. We all can. And I think I, I hope at some point that we can focus as a society on positive impacts on the earth and the planet and potentially also demilitarizing areas um but you how do you how, how when it comes to presenting work now particularly works like this where is the space for it is it still the art space is it still is it still a space how where do you believe that this work can really put put humans in a place where they can start to understand the nature of the world we're in and mm. how um, I don't know. This is a sort of fresh piece of work. This is I've literally finished this within the last sort of six weeks. I've done okay. a couple. I've done a couple of lectures and talks about it. So I'm, you know, I'm in that process of actually, you know, I want to ultimately show this in a, yeah. um, in a, in an exhibition type context, and then hopefully, hopefully off the back of that, it gets sort of editorial. So of course, you know, the the expanded media forms and platforms that people you know, view and can see stuff, of course, is expanding in a sort of pure way. Yeah. Um, to, yeah, to try and exhibit it. I mean, also I can, I'm playing with printing this stuff out because you can yeah. go, you know, I can print these landscapes in a certain context anyway. Uh, so I was quite interested in how you go from a photograph to a piece of sculpture, but it's also a document. Absolutely. And um, what that means, I don't know what that means. But anyway, I'm sort of a, I, in an ideal world, I'd print some of these out and show them in a context that you have this 2D, you then have a sort of th three dimensional rendering of it. Um, but that's all, yeah, that's all in the future, hopefully. But um, no, I could, I could absolutely see that because I'm I'm still conscious of a, a, a notion, which is the idea that a, a war, an image, an image could end the war. And I'm thinking particularly of like Napalm Girl from the Vietnam War or something like mm. that. 
Yeah. Uh, not, yeah, it was Napalm Girl. And how an image like that could really shock a society into thinking, well, we are kind of fueling this thing. Um, but now we are in a much more complex sort of news system where information isn't as clear cut as it could be, yeah. should be, was. Um, and how the way, at this point, I believe we're artists, the way we're trying to innovate the, the, a space that allows people to converse or to think or to be conscious of what's going on. Um, in the one hand, and I find it really interesting that you were born at this real interesting cusp in time in 74 to be the last of a generation of, of young, essentially young people with a camera in a conflict zone to now be an observer of conflict zones. And at this point, really looking for spaces to actually talk about it. Um, now you've got your work in the Imperial War Museum um, and that feels like a natural space for it, but it's not everyone's cup of tea. Uh, but on the other hand, this is, it's an intriguing conversation. That's why I'm really, I'm proud that you've allowed us to share this and get this out. No, no, no. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me as well. I mean, so, you know, um, I don't know. I mean, yeah, as the, the, the continuation of me making work, it deals with conflict, and of course, this was made remotely. So the um, the the Iraqi the, the 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 three D models that I made out there for the New York Times, uh, they ended run end up running one as a sort of animation within the uh, within the online <clears throat> story, and then I kept in touch with the Iraqi army officer. He then sold the drone at the end of the war to a local videographer, who he put me in touch with. And then I built this friendship with this guy over WhatsApp and then trained him up to use the photogrammetry software. Um, and then over the year, he then, right at the fall of Mosul, he went back in for me. I paid him to go make me a photogrammetry set of the Anuri Mosque, which I, you probably, I think you showed it a few ago, um, which was the sort of, that was the site where um, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi made his sort of famous sermon. Yeah, that's the one with his gold watch on. But then they blew that up at the end because that was in that was in West Mosul, which was the, their sort of main stronghold, and they they blew that up as a sort of sign of sort of vengeance just before they got routed. Uh, so that actual image there was made in 2018, and then he sent me the data. I sort of played with it. I didn't really know what I had to do with it at the time. I was then engaged in other stuff, so I sort of left it. And then COVID happened, and. At that same time, I think Qatar put $50 million up for rebuilding the Anuri Mosque. And I've always kept the conversation going with Ayer, who's my drone pilot out there. And he was like, oh, it's, you know, security situations change. You can't fly drones in Mosul at all. And then actually it was in like 2022. I actually, well, after that, actually, he got a job doing for UNESCO, scanning their sites in Mosul. So... That was a you know it was important for me this sort of trade off of skills where by me by me giving him the skills to make this image for me he then got work off that for UNESCO who were scanning their heritage stuff there at the time uh, so you know that was an important important yeah. trade off within having you know having that outreach and having that uh, you know that, that impact on somebody actually there um, and then 2022 he got he got in touch with me and said look. I think I found a guy who knows someone who can get his permission. So that then started this long process of basically he'd get one day's flying in Mosul every six months. <laughs> and then we'd have to reapply and go through like <laughs> Iraqi army and yeah. some of the sites were UNESCO and UNESCO and all of this stuff. But again, within that sort of ethics of it, you know, and I was, I was paying him, you know, top dollar to make these. I also didn't want, it was, you know, effectively not putting him in trouble where suddenly he puts a drone up somewhere he shouldn't and he's getting arrested or shot or whatever. So it was working all of those things out while actually getting the sort of realities of going to fly these sites. But of course, you can't get any more drones into there. So he's got a Phantom Pro and he's got like six batteries and he can basically do three, he could do three sites on every visit to Mosul. So the rest of it took like 18 months to get three days worth of shooting done. Wow. Um, but that's the logistics of it. So for me, it was, yeah, as much as these are, yeah, it's conflict. It's conflict of a place that I have my own history to as, you know, we're yeah. in, both, in both camps, as it were. Yeah. Uh, but also this notion of us being remote now. 
because this is it. You know, virtually, yeah, you just get on your screen now and it's total war. You're just fed. Yeah. And, you know, the more you look at, the more our algorithms feed you. And sadly, there's so much conflict in the world and so many people recording it correctly. So much other propaganda that's re-spinning stuff from all sides as well that, yeah, I think part of the problem that everyone's just like, oh, my God, is because on your phone anyway, you can just be consumed remotely with all of this conflict. So for me, that was the other, another facet to this of, of, you know, of being remote. You know, we are all, yeah, mm -hmm. we're all viewers on it now anyway. Yeah, no, it's, it's an interesting thing of social war. Um, I'm going to change the subject completely. Military rations. Yeah. <laughs> How did you yeah. feel about the Marines and their rations? You know, what really and, and truly, I won't even just realise that the Italian army has, what, nine, a nine-course meal for their rations. What was, what's the Marines saying? I know the Navy seems to have better food than the army, but I just need to know. Well, they go on a tribal thing. The Marines is part of the Navy, so on that level, uh, um, the you know what I was in at a time where there was a lot of change happening. So within that, when I first started training, it was little like tins of like bully beef, and you'd have to open your little tin up. And then within a, a couple of years, it was these sort of boil in the bag, all in one sort of you know, which are actually well, they're a lot nicer than the bully beef. Uh, which I still think they use now, but these sort of boil in the bag, you could sort of eat them cold if, you know, tactically you were somewhere where you couldn't afford to put a fire on or you could heat them up. Um, so actually the food was, actually, the food, you know, it got better. I mean, uh, it was better than the Americans, the MREs, which were their stuff at the time. Nah, I'd have ours only day of the week. Um, but yeah, so it's a big, I mean, people have made bits of work on it. It's a big cultural thing, looking at a ration pack and what that yeah. says about, because the French officers used to have like, wine in there as you know <laughs> so wine and cheese yeah it really is reflective of the of the wider cultures this, this this is the thing isn't it and, and this is the thing that sort of made me intrigue me is because watch looking at some of the pictures when you were younger and, and where there were campfires or whether or not you were dining on the on the road whether you were hunting whether you were eating with the local community uh and then my thoughts went towards your camera and and how they would have seen you with your camera kind of thing but again you sort of answered that by this 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 situation where the phantom pro went to the hands of a local photographer in turn you know used the it's it's mechanics locally as as part of its own local knowledge and lo local use and local needs now uh, that in itself is really something that happens to us as photographers i think at some point we start to throw something back we start to give something back so are you teaching as well at the moment yourself i've been offered a teaching gig uh, end of the year first time for me i've been offered a, a day a week teaching so uh yeah no i'm sort of looking forward to that that's uh, uh but actually back to your whole thing about yeah particularly being an, another in yeah. a in a in a different environment yeah, yeah i uh, for me the real the real moment of that was when i was in iraq for the new york times and because i wasn't embedded it was me and a kurdish driver and there's only a few sort of news organizations new york times being one where they've got the sort of they've kept the 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 histories there with people that mm. you know you go in there and you know this guy's getting paid few hundred dollars a day you know the the sort of bounty on me for him selling me off to isis was probably a couple hundred thousand dollars but this guy was so ideologically set that he needed that he wanted this narrative to be told that he wasn't interested in selling me off for a life-changing amount of money and so one day we were sat on the side of this road in this little town called Gaiara, which is just south of mosul it's a sort of freshly liberated uh isis town and we're just having lunch, eating some falafels, and then the American military roll through, and it's it's like fucking Mad Max, man. It is nuts, and for that, that's why I just sat there and went, "Whoa!" You know, yeah. they literally they had like monster truck on truck, monster truck. These things are like on steroids, and then they've got like you know six inch bulletproof glass, and then they sat behind the bulletproof glass with body armor on, visors on, the whole thing. It was like Alien Landing. You're yeah. just like, wow, you know, yeah. regardless if you're here to help that lot or this lot or whoever, you know, just the physical barriers you're putting up outside of the rest of it are just like, whoa. And of course, yeah. you can see this coming a mile away. 
So, you know, those those people, they're inclined to go, uh -huh, I like, well, what are we getting? Let's set up an ID. Let's get the RPGs out. You know, so <laughs> and that that for me was the real moment where it was like, wow. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Back to 91 when we were there, the, you know, the British military yeah, with its own histories of problems. Uh, yeah. But, you know, we yeah, we never wore glasses. My day and age, you didn't even have body armor but it was very much at least trying to have some sort of human connection where that period of time for me back in 2017, it was, that's the bit where I was like, wow, yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, the optics of that scene are quite interesting, but it does feel like everything's become a little bit more Hollywood in a way, a bit more theatrical totally. in, ter in terms of the costumes and the nature of it. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't know if that's just part and parcel of this new total war that we're living in. Like we made the, the invaders look like alien invaders in an alien environment, you know, and maybe we've seen too many movies to sort of like get us into this mood. It's just a bit odd. I've, well, I think that, I think it's, I think the two reinforce each other. I think yeah. the problem is, is that you grow up watching Terminator movies and then suddenly the next generation of science people, making tech are going great let's make it look like what i saw in the movie when i was a kid so suddenly we end up in terminator world because we'd already had it pre-visualized you know yeah. It's like, yeah and there's a real danger within that so it's sort of we uh we end up in the outcome that we were sort of not necessarily even sort of prophesizing but yes. we were sort of showing and someone goes and creates that and it's never exactly the same but someone becomes inspired by it, even if it's an aesthetic of yeah. well, let's have a you know terminate a dog and you look at like boston dynamics and google and they're dog robots and you're like that looks yeah. like it's out of terminator <laughs> you know, that's it like that's it and and you know even the notion of the drone as we know it now the modern warfare drone was you know that begun in star wars with the imperial drones yeah you know, yeah, in the totally. desert, just like skimming across the desert. You're like, here come the Imperial yeah. drones, everyone ducks under. And it seemed like it was just prophecy in the weirdest possible way. Mm. Um, but I always believed in my heart that I, I believe in the Star Trek universe, you know, where, you know, mankind would finally sort of figure out hunger and all these other problems and just go around the universe, just basically having sex with everything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and that would be it. But no, we are in the, we are in the Star Wars universe. The Empire rules, and no one can strike back. You know, uh, and then there's us lot in the middle, just making ob observations and pointing out observations. You know, yeah. just to just to keep your mind going, like to keep questioning, to keep thinking, and and potentially, as I said, there was a point at which an image could end the war, or certainly end our support of wars, and. Mm. Um, at this point in time, which I thought was really interesting, is that you experience the side effects of a genocidal behaviour, uh, genocidal thinking. And I still wonder, given Mosul and given how many groups were targeted, um, just have we just re-entered the new age of just genocide? It's like it's OK to target a group of people and want rid of them. And I can't understand why. I think yeah. the sad reality is, is that the term genocide is new. Mm. If you look back at the histories of the world, it's been one lot arrive, exterminate the next. It's just that there was no notion of human rights or a sort of human right legal framework around that. You know, whether it's the Byzantium's trashing wherever in, you know, and they'd, you know, they'd sack the whole city. They generally kill everyone in the city as they took the city. So sadly, the human nature aspect, sadly, uh, is still there it's just that we live in an interconnected world now and at points certain people have tried to sort of put framework around it to try and go this isn't cool uh and i think sadly you know the west and whatever sort of at certain points whatever sort of moral moral high ground it tried to have is lost you know and it's like you know oh three you know that was me you know i was in 91 and that was a, a an intervention to go in there and try and help out, uh, you know, minority people who are suffering. And then uh, when 03 kicked off, I was on that march and, you know, I was on that march in London, um, you know, and that was some of a lived experience of that place going, whoa, 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 what are you guys doing? This is like, you know, and I think the repercussions of that, suddenly you get into everyone else doing, you know, Mr. Putin, whoever. Yeah. But everyone's just going, well, hold on a minute. You lot go and do stuff. Yeah. So who yeah. you've got to tell us? And then this is part of the problem we've got to now. 
Absolutely. I used to feel that on the streets where whenever these sort of wars would arise, the correlation to the stabbings on the streets would sort of almost be affected, you know, because the youths would recognise this as nothing more than governmental muggings. You know, you're hitting someone up, mm. you're hit, treating Iraq like a petrol station, hitting them up and sucking and drive all their petrol. It, it mm. felt like, oh, well, if that's how the adults are playing, this is how we're going to play too. And it intensified another level of behaviour on, totally. on the streets. You know, um, unless you hold... So, no, so, 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 it feels disingenuous as the older generation seems to be very wrong and strong about its views, you know, um, without necessarily being on the ground, removing the masks and the bulletproof glass and actually looking people in the eye again. Yeah, yeah. I think it takes a certain amount of bravery to do that. And, totally. um, um, something's been lost. And, I'm, and, I, and is it because you know, the, it's a, it's the fantasies become more uh, alluring than the reality? Um, well, no one's yeah, held accountable. I think this is the big problem. No one's it, held man. accountable. Unless people are held... You can only start to build a framework that other people... As if actually you can go, okay, we hold ours accountable, so now we're going to hold you accountable. But when no one gets held accountable, how? who are you? They go, well, who are you to tell us what to do when you do all this stuff and no one gets held accountable? Exactly. <laughs> you know, exactly. Like, exactly. Um, uh, yeah, and I have to agree, it's the collapse of accountability. And this this runs right throughout all our systems right now. And um, I think we're coming up to the anniversary of uh, Grenfell soon. You know, mm. and to this day, no one's held accountable for wrapping a building in plastic and setting it alight. Mm. Um, totally. it, and, it, and, and, the, and the same could be said with a non-connected, particularly in the military, of just basic things, like things aren't truly connected. Maybe they never were connected. Um, what happens in the field and the people that are in the field doing the work are more and more... I think they've, they've been trained to be disconnected now, aren't they? They're trained to treat everything like it's some kind of computer game. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I I can't speak for now. I think okay. you know, there's always you know, uh, you know, sort of unit I was in, you know, Marines is you know because it's a uh, uh, you know it's a commando type unit. You'd get lots of different roles. You had to wear different sort of head, as it or different hat at different times. So as much as people think it's just you know thuggery and whatever i'm not i'm not denying there weren't those sorts of characters in there because they because they were but the way you'd have to operate it was actually very nuanced because sometimes you'd be distributing aid to people next minute you're having to police people next minute you're having to fight people so it, it's a it's a very fluid type thing within the different environments you're in um i think the problem with and i don't think that has actually changed i think the problem you have is that the longer you spend in these places, the more dehumanized you get. And this becomes the problem, particularly that the Americans ran into in sort of, uh, you know, in Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, the Brits only do, do a tour for six months. The Americans are doing a tour for a year and they, they were finding it harder to recruit. So they lowered the, the, the uh, sort of inscripting type, uh, you know, measures where, you know, you couldn't, you know, beforehand in my day, gang members, certain types of criminal record, people who had certain sort of substance abuse, mental health problems, weren't allowed in the military. Mm. Well, the Americans definitely in the, in the, in the noughties went, oh no, we're running our guys. They lowered all those standards. So then you're putting people into what are, you know, war zones. And then for whatever reasons, ideologically, mental health, whatever, well, these people ain't going to start becoming good Samaritans when they're then put in a year of hard fighting somewhere so that sort of aspect of human nature and then suddenly you've got stuff happening on your watch is of no real surprise sadly um absolutely but it's absolutely yeah is it is it any coincidence absolutely is it any coincidence i think it's the last question i'm going to ask but is it any coincidence that the, the largest sort of bank heist of all time was done in iraq do you think given the amount of criminality there was i think it was something in the close to a billion dollars cash well, I, you know, I know just out of, out of guys that I, you know, I was, you know, I got mentally discharged in 94. There were characters that I was in Iraq with who then left sort of late 90s because there wasn't a lot happening. And they all got into the sort of private military contractor world. And, you know, that whole, and when Iraq kicked off, they all went in there and, you know, were making offshore money and all of that stuff. And, yeah, they had, you know, one of, our, one of those guys I knew was actually working at Baghdad Airport in 03. 
and literally the Americans were flying in pallets, billions and billions of dollars in cash that they'd been, it was all sanctioned oil money that Saddam couldn't get his hands on. So we, they were trying to use that as reconstruction. You know, oh, that's fair enough. But literally there were people flying in from Amman in Jordan, turning up at the airport with like a made up photo, you know, a piece of paper going, oh yeah, I'm here to build a school in you know, Najaf and yeah. someone so signed it. And literally, she told me one day, literally this guy turned up 20 million in unmarked bills. He got the next flight back to a mark. I mean, it was just like, wild, wild west, just, exactly. just madness. So, yeah. but of course, that's where particularly there, where the Americans got it so wrong, because, you know, they yeah. just, they got rid of the infrastructure. They got rid of all the civil servants there. So, of course, you just created yeah. mayhem. It's exactly yeah. what you don't do. I think it's in the Yeah, yeah, totally. Back of the art of war it's the very thing you don't do but um yeah who knows if they'll ever learn from that and you know, <laughs> yeah. if anyone's ever going to be held accountable for that i found that really interesting i think at this point in our conversation we usually sort of ask adam to jump in just to make sure that we haven't been waffling on sort of like <laughs> it, and lost 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 the shape of the conversation by going into other things but adam what, what would you pick up from our conversation no it's been it's, no, it's been fantastic i mean i i gotta admit i've I was thinking particularly a lot about the the photogrammetry because it's a, a lot of my work is um, it does focus a lot on Militech and sort of the contemporary way in which data functions, and so a mm. lot of my work in a lot of my books are repeat and zero as well. It's mostly been on the concepts of like recognition and how we code images and some of just the pretty weird ways in which the map and the territory just kind of interact. And I, I was just thinking about drones and sort of the, it, it's not so much technology of drones i think a lot of it is how yes yeah, as you said Giles, it's a social context for good or evil and there's definitely a sense in which the way in which these images are sort of tagged and recognized and you have these, you know, these various pull points it, it does get frightening i mean like especially for like facial recognition stuff i mean you know when we when we log on to a website these days you know usually it's like a, a capture you know to pick every one that's got a bike and that you know it says you're human and People do these for like pennies on on the pound in refugee well, well pen, literal pennies in refugee camps now, and um, usually they end up training basically these machines that recognise faces like them, and it is yeah. sold on the companies like Hick Vision and TKH, uh, it's, it's, they're Dutch and Chinese respectively, and you can see that in sort of like you know new ways of, of surveillance, almost you know apartheid sort of things. So it's, it's interesting to see how yeah, the and they have their own they have the in of photography, yeah. Yeah, and then you know the bias. So then, just you know, or you know, <laughs> the mm. bias just go straight back into that tech. So it's like you know, mm. and it's, it kind of highlights really the importance of the photographer as, I guess, artist and also encoder of the image. Because otherwise, if you just automate it, you automate the biases as well. You know, it's, it's less of that reflection, less of that. You know, as yeah, the spirit behind the lens of putting a, a quick plug there. And that's, I just, I just really enjoyed listening to this conversation. On, I mean, also. I got to admit, I do have a weird fascination with military rations. So there's this guy on YouTube, <laughs> Steve MRE, and he's on the, he's a huge bloody channel. All he does is open up any ration he can find. He runs a museum of them, and he's basically yeah. like those like, unwrapping goodie bags. He's like, Fuck, they used to have cigarettes in there. Like he opens up an old journal. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah, like, yeah. Oh, these are tablets, and um, and yeah, do you buy them? Like, do you buy it? Yeah, do you buy them? Do you get involved? Oh no! The, no? the the only ones that are affordable are these know. Belarusian ones. They're disgusting. <laughs> I don't know. There's there's some that do tempt me. I, I think the IDF and their tins of tuna. I definitely want some IDF tuna, but that's about it, really. <laughs> um, and the wines that come with um, what's it called? Uh, the Italian, yeah, the Italian and the French. Definitely would love to try their wines because I had the belief that the best wine and best... cheese. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Exactly. And whether or not the best food in Italy ever leaves Italy, that's the question I always wondered. So <laughs> that's the other thing. Uh, but I have to thank you, Giles, for this conversation. I know it's sort of, it's got shorter and we could sort of like delve into many different av avenues because we're reminded of how human conflict is and how the technology and, and the mistakes built into conflicts, like conflicts come around because people have failed to win the peace. And 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 those and and then how did, I, I'm sort of doubling down this idea of when we're wrong and strong, where where where, sh where we find strength even though we're wrong, where we double down and find invest in technology just to make a point, but actually 
what is the point? You know, like really, what is the point? Like, as as you, as you said in O three, what were we do? What was our whole thing doing here at that time? When obviously you needed, yes, to remove Saddam, but you 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 could have just sent in a drone, <laughs> and that's what we're left with. I, you know, yeah. it's yeah. I mean, it's everything. Ultimately, yeah. You know, conversations are always much better than conflict. You know, and sometimes this you do have it. to sit down with people yeah. who you know don't align or quite think your way. But that's a much better way of trying to navigate than you know than the other than the other option. Because ultimately, you end up back at that point anyway. There's a point down the time we've done all this chaos and destruction. You come down, you're like, oh, okay, now we've got to sit down and talk about this. So it's, yeah. Yeah. And I, th I think it's interesting looking at these images in this context is we're looking at aftermath. We're not looking at the sort of emotional, visceral bodies, blood. It's just literally rubble. And as you said earlier, you can't tell the difference between that someone's home or a school or a car park. It's just almost like the end of everything, just and dust to dust. It's, it's a it's the mm. weirdest visualization of conflicts that that really yeah sort of, yeah I think that last one there's a, there is a there's a there's a bizarre cyclical aspect to some of these images that image yeah. there because it's a bit like are these minarets being formed or exploded so yeah. actually you know for me that particular image talks about the cyclical histories of the places uh, you know, I took it in for my own decades of conflict out there to historically further back there's this rebuilding and destruction there's this rebuilding and destruction it's like this you know as we've been saying this cyclical aspect of mm. sadly human nature and conflict um, mm. but um yeah oh this is it so Giles at this point if there's anything you need to plug obviously let us know any shows obviously if there's any gallerists watching this you know what to do but it doesn't really work like that does it you have to do the <laughs> they, they have to discover you somehow uh, yeah that's just sort of yeah how that works i don't know that's a whole mm. sort of this is it <laughs> and, and magical I do world in itself yeah. this is it. it is a mystical magical world isn't it how many how many drunken conversations lead to lead to really good uh, outcomes and you'd be surprised how many they are um <laughs> i wanted to ask about the image behind you uh, this one, blow up, yeah, the the, the one that looks like a a, a, lands, a lunar landscape of some kind, yeah. And how personal was that to you? That's an image that I shot um, at Mount Everest Base Camp, and that's actually of the uh, Kimbo Ice Fault, which is the the uh, that's the first bit that people climb up when they're trying to climb Everest. You can see lots of tiny little bodies on it, um, mm. and that was. Uh, that was an assignment I was doing for New York Times magazine. Have, you, have you climbed Everest? Uh, no, I mean, I spent like just over a week at the bottom of it. Um, you know, I, no, I do. I mean, that's the sort of, the, the byproduct to the Marines was the sort of love of the outdoors and mountains and stuff. That's my sort of escape, go-to sort of place. Um, Everest, I don't know, that whole piece of work was how it's become this sort of, exper you know, it's like sort of, um, it's like sort of burning man on acid now. You go to, you go to base camp Everest and there's like, you know, the year I was there in 2015, that one was shot just before the earthquake destroyed it. In 2016, Paul Oakenfold is doing a DJ set up there. You know, there's like the best chefs. No, no, I mean, it's become like the Uber naught point senders. It's like, oh, we've done Burning Man for 10 years. We're going to go base camp Everest and climb it. You know, there's a commercial commodification of, of that environment. Um, so it's very much about that, uh, and it's very much about the sort of people drawn there. And in as much as it was those, there were just all sorts of other people there who were doing it for, you know, you know, very realistic, honourable sort of reasons. But it was just this this scale again. It's just humans. We turn up, and what we're going to do? We're just going to, you know, keep moving along, yeah. capitalising yeah. it, colonising it, whatever. Suddenly, it's, there's an opportunity. Let's all jump in, and then what happens? <laughs> you know, and I hope it doesn't go that way, but you know, in twenty years' time, there'll probably be a you know revolving restaurant on the top of it or something. And, you know, people will be like getting helicopter out there for lunch or stuff. But anyway, yeah, exactly. And, uh, and yeah, yeah. I'm thinking when that day comes and they have a 
two star Michelin restaurant on on the on the precipice of the you know Everest mountain. I'll turn up and you know, excuse me, have you got any Wi Fi, please? I need to stay <laughs> watching my screen. I need to and fly my drone. All this nonsense around me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. I'm, I'm out here uh, with my AI backgrounds to fix up all my problems, and suddenly, yeah. somehow, I'm living in a utopian Star Wars universe. But I'm still holding out for the Star Trek universe. So anyway, I think, yeah, hold on to that one, Eddie. I will. I will. I'll do my best. And you know, until we meet again next time at some random opening with a glass of bad wine in our hands, I really appreciate this conversation, and I really appreciate the insight you've given us. And thank you again for joining us for this conversation of the spirit behind the lens, um, and and being that spirit behind the lens and being conscious enough from that age of fifteen, sixteen. Uh, I think you should thank your younger self for just being on it, <laughs> even though, but you were on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to talk. I appreciate that. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Cheers.